a nice summer day and you're scrolling on your phone, watching 15 second videos for a quick dopamine hit because you're procrastinating as usual. You come across a healthy girl, that girl, hot summer glow up transformation video and you think to yourself, I could totally do that if I tried. Ugh, I don't have the time or energy for any of that. I'm already so tired and all of that stuff is BS anyway. But then, being the self-aware person that you are, you start to think, maybe I'm just being pessimistic. I wonder if these habits actually make any difference. So, you search up healthy habits to take up the summer and come across a 12-point list with daily habits that you've probably heard over and over and over again. Get 8 hours of sleep. Have a solid breakfast. Exercise. Eat 5 servings of fruits and vegetables. Drink 8 cups slash 2 liters of water. Journal, plan in an agenda, read, make your bed, brush your teeth, wash your face, and lastly, skincare with SPF. I mean, honestly, all those seem pretty typical. How hard could it be? Will I really feel better? I should try to challenge myself. And here we are, doing 12 healthy habits for a week. In order to make this more interesting, every day not only will I be keeping a little verbal diary, but also I will be trying to talk about the science and evidence behind each of these healthy habits, or if they're really just myths. And at the end, I'll share what I learned throughout this week, my reflections, and how these habits can be life-changing. Lastly, let's be clear that huge, massive transformations cannot be possible within a week, no matter what the habit is. Remember, on this channel we say consistency is key and progress over perfection. Let's begin with day one. Good morning, it's July 1st and it's 10.30 a.m. I kind of slept late yesterday because my sleep schedule is messed up, um, but I fell asleep at probably around 2. So there's my first habit, which is sleeping eight hours a night. Done. On this day, we're going to explore more about the habit of getting eight hours of sleep. Nowadays, it seems impossible to get a full eight hours of sleep every single night between school, work, socializing, chores, extracurriculars, and so many more activities. Who has the time to be unconscious for a whole eight hours? Do we even need to sleep that much in the first place? Well, sleep is obviously dependent on every individual, but what we do know for sure is that it is extremely important. Firstly, sleep regulates your emotions. Being sleep deprived for just one night can increase your emotional response to negative feelings by 60%. Sleep also regulates your body's essential functions like appetite control, immune system, and your metabolism. Poor sleep can also increase your chance of developing chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. One study even found that getting only 5 hours of sleep per night for 4 nights in a row negatively affected mental performance to the same extent as having a blood alcohol content of 0.06. For context, in Ontario, my province in Canada, a blood alcohol level of 0.05 will get you a license suspension and a monetary penalty for first-time offenders over 21 years old. But none of this answers the question of how much sleep you actually need per night. According to researchers, it is rare for anyone to need fewer than six hours of sleep to function. When someone says they are totally fine without sleep, it's more likely that they are simply used to the negative effects of reduced sleep, but that does not mean that their body needs any less. They are actually performing at a lower level rather than adapting to being awake more. The functional decline happens gradually, so they don't even realize it. However, I'm going to note that there is an extremely rare genetic mutation that allows some people to function well at low levels of sleep. What we do know is that most adults between 18 to 24 years need 7 to 9 hours of sleep, with 8 being the average, which is where this habit of 8 hours of sleep comes from, but it definitely varies between person to person. I completely understand that some people just don't have the luxury of 
getting enough sleep. Those working multiple jobs just to get by, those who are single parents but also in school and working, those who have sleeping disorders. Honestly, getting good and enough sleep is truly a privilege that we often take for granted and it would be ignorant of me to ignore those in certain circumstances. Sometimes in university, however, it's kind of like a status symbol to actually not get enough sleep. I talked about the toxic college culture regarding actually bragging about having less sleep than your peers in a video that I made last year. Oh my gosh, you got six hours of sleep? Well, I only got three. Maybe this makes people feel like they're busy, committed to their work, and they're tough enough to get by. I remember literally talking to a guy once who told me he found dark circles around my eyes attractive because it makes him think that the woman is hard working. A red flag. But personally, I believe we need to shift a conversation towards proudly reclaiming a full night's rest and truly value the importance of sleep. And pulling an all-nighter once in a while or not getting enough sleep some days won't hurt you in the long run time to go outside on a run it's 27 degrees i think i'm definitely going to overheat let's try our best I mean, maybe you stayed up late one day partying or you forgot that you had an essay due the next day. No shame, that's happened to me before. But the constant sleep deprivation day after day is what's the problem. If you think about it, what is that extra money, those extracurriculars, that A grade doing? If you don't have a healthy body, a million dollars is worth less than a penny when you have an untreatable life-threatening illness. A grade is just a letter when you find yourself in a car accident, injuring others as well as yourself because of a lack of sleep. Nothing is worth sacrificing your health for. So I ran four kilometers. The first two kilometers were fine because I stepped outside and I was like, it's not even that hot. But then by like two and a half kilometers, I started dying. The last one and a half kilometers, I literally took four breaks. I'm glad that I finished it in the end. Today, I felt really good. I got a full eight and a half hours of sleep, did my morning routine. My run was harder than normal. I often see people on the internet bashing others for their pace that might be slower or when they have to stop to catch their breath. I used to be so self-conscious of running outside because of other people judging me, but I don't know why anyone who is sitting on their butt typing mean comments should have any effect on my decisions. Later, I had food with my family and then I went to a camp Canada day barbecue and ate some more. Reading just one chapter was actually hard because usually at night I scroll on my phone. Okay, it's 12.40. I'm gonna probably read until one, finish the rest of this water. And I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning it's um 9 43 i woke up at 9 30 and i've just been responding to comments let's get our day started shall we Sometimes I think to myself, why would I make my bed in the mornings if I'm just going to sleep in it and mess it all up again later at night? To be honest, the scientific research of the impact of making your bed each morning specifically is slim. However, there is a lot of evidence that shows a clear link between an organized clutter-free space and being more productive and having lower levels of stress. A decluttered environment makes for a decluttered mind. One of the biggest things that is the center of attention in your room is most likely your bed. William H. McRaven, the author of the book Make Your Bed, Little Things Can Change Your Life and Maybe the World, extols the idea that making your bed in the morning sets you up for success. It is the first accomplishment of the day and provides the motivation for more larger daily tasks. On TikTok, I often see people commenting that making your bed right away after you wake up is more likely to breed germs and an unmade bed can let your sheets breathe. This comes from an older study from 2001 where they predicted that making your bed 
bed can lead to a dark, damp breeding ground for germs. Its author called making the bed an unprecedented health risk. However, this study is a bit misleading and plus, a simple solution is to just wash your sheets often like you should be doing anyways. In the end, making your bed or not making it won't drastically make your life worse or better. But personally, it's something that takes one minute in the mornings and I do it most days, but I won't lose my mind if I go a day with messy bed sheets. Now let's talk about breakfast. This topic is really confusing because we used to hear that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But now there are things like intermittent fasting and intuitive eating and a lot of contradicting ideas. Not going to lie, nutrition is a difficult topic to talk about with heaps of science in all kinds of direction. What should we eat and when? For what goals? Long life? Weight loss? Feeling good? What complicates it even more is that breakfast is a profitable business. No wonder some of these studies are funded by large cereal corporations trying to convince us that their bowl of sugar first thing in the morning is healthy. One study that analyzed the health data of 50,000 people over seven years found that people who made breakfast the largest meal of the day were more likely to have a lower body mass index than those who ate a large lunch or dinner. They then argued that breakfast helps increase satiety, reduce calorie intake, and improve the quality of our diet. However, others argue that it is not the breakfast itself Self that caused the participants to be a lower weight, but instead, those who chose to eat a breakfast are more conscientious overall about their lifestyle and participate in other health enhancing behaviors like not smoking and regular exercise. Honestly, guys, I don't really know. I would rather admit I don't understand something than give you guys the wrong information. Remember, a lot of this video is just my personal experience, too. The scientific evidence is literally all over the place here, but personally, I think that if you're a breakfast, person then eat it if you're not then don't i think the type of food matters much more than what time you eat it at for example a huge pepperoni pizza at 8 a.m is obviously worse for you than a filling quinoa bowl later in the day let's go as you can see i don't really eat traditional breakfast foods for breakfast either so it's just all up to you Today was also a lovely day. I did my typical morning routine for my exercise. I went to the gym in the evening and I totally forgot the hours were reduced for Canada Day weekend. So I only had time to run two kilometers and then do 20 minutes of weight. Later in the evening to celebrate Canada Day again, I went to my sister's boyfriend's house and his parents made lots of delicious food. At the end of the day, I read another chapter of my book, but not going to lie, it was still hard to fight the urge of reaching for my phone. I got this retinol serum. I'm going to incorporate it into my skincare routine and see if it does anything. I don't know if it does anything, but... See you tomorrow. <laughs> I've been writing in a diary since literally I could write. I showed you some of my diaries from like 2008 and 2009 in a video from last month and it was so funny. As a super emotional person, writing down my thoughts has always been an outlet for me. 
and it's not just me either. Brain scans have shown that putting feelings down on paper reduces activity in a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is responsible for controlling the intensity of our emotions. Dr. Lieberman from UCLA says that writing seems to help the brain regulate emotions unintentionally, whether it's writing things down in a diary, writing bad poetry, or making up song lyrics that should never be played on the radio. It seems to help people emotionally. There are other obvious benefits like a boost in mindfulness, memory, and communication skills. Journaling can also lead to better sleep, more self-confidence, and even a stronger immune system. How is that possible? It's a whole cascade of things that occur, says Dr. Penn Baker, a social psychologist at the University of Texas. Journaling can help label emotions and acknowledge traumatic events, things that are often incorporated into therapy, and therefore in turn allows us to make sense of the trauma, leading to better memory and sleep, which then improves our immune system and our mood. Dr. Penn Baker's research has found that even a one-time 15 to 30 minute session of focused journal writing can be beneficial. On the contrary, sometimes writing too much can be a problem because then it becomes more like rumination. So what do we write about? During the first couple days of this challenge, I wrote in the mornings, whereas the last couple days I wrote before bed. I think I prefer the latter because then I'd have a whole whole day to talk about and reflect on the day that just passed, as well as talk about what I want to do the next day. There are also plenty of journal prompts online as well if you don't have anything to write about. I don't usually journal every day either. You might have noticed that some of the shots today are the same from my last video, well, you'd be right. Today I decided to take myself on a picnic date. It was really peaceful, so you can check out that video after this one if you want. For our exercise, I ran 3 kilometers and then finished with a 1.25 kilometer walk. For dinner, my parents made lots of delicious Chinese dishes because my sister was still home for the weekend and she doesn't live close by anymore. And finally, reading was a lot more enjoyable today and I actually read four chapters today. I think my urge to reach for my phone while reading has definitely lessened today and um, hopefully I'll just improve more and more. See you tomorrow. If I ever lose you now, I'd be losing myself too. I'll never put you down. All my heart hopes you never do. And if the world ain't lit tonight, you better believe I'd be by your side. Who I used to be is now somebody new. Yeah, the best parts of me were made from loving. I actually think my skin looks a lot better. I've been seeing more and more videos on YouTube and other social medias about reading and books, which is so exciting. When I was younger, I was so obsessed with reading. Every month, I would be allowed to order one book from the Scholastic Book Order. I would even try to sneakily read during class. As I've grown up, however, there are more instant forms of entertainment like watching a video on YouTube or scrolling on social media on my phone. But reading is so good for you in many different ways. Firstly, research has shown that people who read literary fiction shows a heightened ability to understand the feelings and beliefs of others. This ability is called the theory of mind by researchers, a set of skills essential for building, navigating, and maintaining social relationships. This doesn't happen instantly though. Long-term fiction readers tend to have a better developed theory of mind. Reading can also help with stress. A 2009 study found that 30 minutes of reading lowered blood pressure, heart rate, and feelings of psychological distress just as effectively as yoga and humor. All these little moments, I'm glad I get to spend them with you. So I've just been editing. I finished this bottle of water. 
I think sometimes people feel pressure to read self-help books or non-fiction or adult books, but honestly, I feel like to get the love of reading back, just read whatever you want. YA novels, romance books, books that you loved when you were younger. I liked The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. I'm currently reading The Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren, and on my shelf, I have People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. And even in the coldest night, if we're listening on picking fights. Today was a typical day. Honestly, I've been feeling really good. I did my usual morning habits, then in the afternoon, I ran one and a half kilometers to the soccer field near my house, and I played soccer with my friends for about 40 minutes. I think sometimes people are really confused when they first start exercising. It can be so overwhelming. What exercises should I do and when? How do I do them? How often do I do them? I think oftentimes, the first step is to just get moving, no matter what the exercise is or how short the session is. Is, and to stay consistent. For example, that could just be playing soccer with your friends outside or going on a short walk. It doesn't have to be super intense. Then after you get the hang of things, maybe you could learn some more and increase your exercise in a different way. Later in the evening, I read a couple more chapters and I'm really getting into the book. I will see you tomorrow. Hello, good morning. I actually stayed out too late reading that book. So today I only got seven hours of sleep. So I have to take a nap in the middle of the day to make it eight hours. Actually, um, I just had to go pick up something and then I came back and fell asleep. So yeah, eight hours plus. <laughs> Water is your body's principal chemical component and makes up about 50 to 70 percent of your body weight. Your body depends on water to survive. Every cell, tissue, and organ in your body needs water to work properly. But is drinking eight cups of water a day fact or fiction? It's hard to pinpoint exactly where this rule came from, but obviously there is now research that it might be too much for some and too little for others. There is actually little evidence to support the eight cups a day claim. Water is also not your only source of hydration. Water and fruits, vegetables, juice, tea, and coffee also count. Speaking of coffee, the claim that it dehydrates you also seems to be a myth. There was no evidence of dehydration with moderate daily coffee intake found in a study published in 2014. Caffeinated beverages do not increase urinary water losses above the amount of water contained in those beverages. How much water a person needs depends on three factors. Body weight, bigger people need more water, environmental temperature, when it's hotter, people sweat and lose water, and physical activity levels. Increased exercise intensity increases sweat water losses. I was honestly surprised to read about this because I've always thought that the more water I drink, the better, and that drinking more of it will flush out toxins and improve kidney function, but that is simply not true. It's always nice to learn things that are different from your original opinion. Not that water is not important. Mild dehydration hydration can have negative effects on both mental and physical performances. The bottom line is, drink enough water until you have pale, clear urine and drink water when you're hot and sweaty, when you're losing a lot of fluid and listen to your thirst signal. How much water you need is very individually dependent. What if each day, sunshine or gray, I wake up and say that I let this day Take me Today was another good day. I'm actually very surprised about how good I'm feeling and how well I'm doing with these habits. Well, that's until the nighttime at least. You'll understand what I mean in the next chapter. Embraces possibilities I'll ignite. Then the next morning I drive to work. People annoy me and I'm spilling. So um, maybe you're wondering why did I take a 
goodnight clip yet. Well, it's because I didn't go to sleep yet because after soccer, I continued editing my video and I couldn't stop because because I just really wanted to finish it. Unfortunately, it's 6.42 a.m. and in order to get eight hours of sleep, I would literally need to sleep until 2 p.m., which I cannot do. Today just might be an L. It's later. I slept like three hours, but every time I post, I get like major anxiety for some reason and i'm like okay i know we're okay like don't look at the numbers don't look at the numbers but it's just hard not to look at the numbers anyways um i can't sleep anymore so i'm just gonna respond to comments on my new video and try to do my other healthy habits today i also didn't read yesterday or journal so um day six everyone the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported in 2010 that only 33% of adults were eating the daily recommended amount of fruit, and even fewer, 27%, were meeting their vegetable quota. The numbers for teens were even worse. But do we really need to eat that much fruit and vegetables a day? Compared with people who said they ate just two servings of fruits or vegetables each day, people who ate five servings per day had a 13% lower risk of death from any cause, a 12% lower risk of death from heart heart disease or stroke, a 10% lower risk of death from cancer, and a 35% lower risk of death from respiratory diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The most effective combination of fruits and vegetables among study participants was two servings of fruits plus three servings of veggies a day for a total of five servings daily. The biggest health benefits came from eating leafy green vegetables like kale and spinach and fruits and vegetables rich in vitamin C and beta carotene like citrus, berries, and Carrot. These are primary sources of antioxidants that may play a role in preventing cancer, says Dr. Wei. Interestingly, eating more than five servings of fruits or vegetables per day didn't seem to provide any additional benefit in lowering the risk of death. Alright, just came back from soccer. We won, of course. I'm so tired. I cannot wait to go to bed. Neither did eating starchy vegetables like peas, corns, or potatoes, or drinking fruit juices. Remember that five servings a day is on average, so if you don't eat any one day, you won't keel over, just to make it up within the week. Obviously, today didn't start off so great without sleep. I think it was much harder to do my habits than usual. For example, I felt really off during soccer and I could barely keep my eyes open for a page of reading. Not to mention how ugly my handwriting was in my journal. If it wasn't for this challenge, I would have just went to bed. Hopefully, I'll rest up tonight and do better tomorrow. You and I can't go quiet on a Brooklyn bound train So I stand Good morning! It's the last day I'll have you know that a full 8 hours of sleep today. On this last day, let's talk about the habit that our parents have ingrained in us since we were young. Brush your teeth twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. Additionally, floss once a day as well. I think dental health is something that people often overlook, but having healthy teeth is a huge part of your appearance and health, even outside of the mouth. Results from a large 2019 study found that having good oral hygiene may reduce your risk of atrial fibrillation and heart failure. There are also better ways of taking care of your teeth than others. A 2014 research review showed that an electric toothbrush is more effective at reducing plaque and gingivitis than a standard brush. A fluoride toothpaste is preferred and any type of floss as wax and unwax doesn't have a difference in the effectiveness according to the ADA works as well. Boys. 
For this last day, I felt way better than a day before with the full 8 hours of sleep but still not 100%. I did my usual morning habits, then I had to go to a neighboring city so I packed some fruit for that trip. Later in the evening, I went out with my friends and I ordered a veggie pizza and then we went out on a night walk for about 2 kilometers as my daily exercise. I was so tired by the time I got home that I only read a few pages once again. Firstly, I timed this challenge so it would be a lot easier for me than usual. I did it during Canada Day long weekend so I knew that there would be a lot of food made for me and I didn't have a very strict schedule so I could do the activities whenever I wanted to. I'd definitely be interested in doing this challenge for when I am living alone and working a strict schedule in the future. Even then, with all the odds in my favor, I still wasn't completely perfect. I also found it hard to constantly film everything so here is my habit tracker for the week. As you can see my days 5 and 6 were pretty messed up due to me staying up late during the night time and I didn't do my nightly habits for day 5 and I didn't have the energy to do some of my habits for day 6. The goal in the end though is to make these habits second nature, automatic. But not all habits are created equal and some don't even have to be daily. As we talked about in the video, some of these numbers for these habits are dependent on the individual or even arbitrary. So adjust them to your own individual needs. As always, be sure to do your own research if you want to because some of these things are a little bit hard to understand and 5 minutes in a video won't paint the full picture. As for the rankings, I would definitely put sleep in the number one place. Without sleep, I would literally have so much less motivation and energy to do all of the other habits and daily activities throughout the day. In tier two, I would put brushing teeth, washing face, skincare, and exercise, as well as eating fruits and vegetables and drinking water. These are like kind of things that can directly affect your health. And in the last tier, these things are beneficial, but you don't have to do them every single day. I would say that these things are like optional, but make me feel better. So in tier three, I would put journaling, reading, planning, making my bed, and eating breakfast. Of course, this whole like ranking thing is just based off of my own opinion, so if you have different opinions, please let me know below. I really hope that this video provided you some motivation to try out some of these habits or even incorporate one of these habits into your daily routine. Sometimes when you start doing things that are good for you, it makes you feel good as well. And then since you feel good, you continue to do the things that are good for your body, kind of like a loop. This video was also kind of different um, to my other videos. Obviously, this video was super long. And let me tell you, it was a tough one to edit. So please leave a like and subscribe if you want to. Let me know if you enjoyed these longer videos, like these challenge videos. Tell me what you liked and what you didn't like, or if you disagreed with anything that I said, leave a comment down below. I read all of my comments. I appreciate you guys so, so much and follow me on my instagram if you want to i will see you guys next time